So I have a pre-recorded talk here that I will start up. Um, I do want to say that this is from our, I can't remember the case number, but it is the ACDRL1 gene. And so we will be going through um, a, a variant curation for that variant, for the variant that was identified. Um, and this is from a gene that has already been curated. So it's, there's a definitive curation um, from the clinical genome resource. And that was done by a gene curation expert panel. So let me go ahead and screen share and do it. There we go, I'll share sound, optimize for video. Sharing this. Hi, my name is Deb Ritter from Baylor College of Medicine, and I work for the Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen. So today we'll be reviewing curating a known variant in the ClinGen Variant Curation Interface, or VCI. So why might you curate a known variant? Well, one reason is to learn how to curate within the VCI. Um, and other reasons might be that, you know, the variant might have a classification um, on a, a site such as ClinBar, but maybe it only has one classification like the variant will do today, and you might have additional data to add to it. Um, or you may have um, you may have checked a different reference or have found another reference as well. So a couple of things to know just starting out with the variant curation interface. So some of the materials that came with this were to review through the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, ACMG, and the Association of Molecular Pathologists, AMP, um, guidelines that came out in 2015. And talked about the different types of evidence that are available to curate and then created a um, sort of a nominal classification system of evidence codes that then are combined to create a final um, variant classification. So the ClinGen VCI is an interface in order to apply those evidence codes um, in a variant classification and, and to keep that um, evidence in one central location. So I always suggest this process when learning the variant curation interface is to play first. So we have a test site, and that's the site that we will be using today. Um, and you can log in and create an account. This gets deleted periodically, and um, the deletion date is posted on the site. Um, but here you can test and try out features. You know, you don't need to um, be scared to use it or like think you might like put something out into other uh, databases. This is just contained within this one site. Um, and so you can, it's a, it's a good testing space. Then I suggest learning more. So there are some training videos that are available. There is a variant curation SOP that provides many additional materials as well. And then there's also a volunteer process that we have where you can volunteer and receive an in-depth training and potentially join uh, an expert panel. So then the last here is joining an expert panel or alternatively requesting an affiliation for a laboratory or group. We have those as well. And then this would be done in what's known as the production version of the VCI. And in this case, then the variants that are um, curated within the production version would be able to um, be pushed on to ClinVar or the evidence repository, which is a um, interface that's used to display a lot of the curated data and cu detailed curated data uh, for variants that are in the VCI. So once you are in the variant curation interface, and we'll do this live in, in just a bit, um, but once you're in the variant curation interface, you can navigate to home. Um, and so this is a dashboard view here. And then at the home uh, button here, you can click and change this affiliation. So we won't spend too long on it because um, many people that are just learning the uh, ClinGen BCI won't have any other affiliation. However, if you do join an expert panel or have a laboratory or group affiliation, you need to make sure that as you are working within the VCI, you work under the correct affiliation. So in this case, we will be doing the work in no affiliation, which is the affiliation we'll use um, that, that is not uh, assigned to any of these other groups, for instance. 
So then we will, um, you can go to the ClinGen VCI and then to start a variant curation, you press the new variant curation button and that opens up a new window that will then ask for what's known as a ClinVar ID or a ClinGen allele registry ID. So I'll briefly show how to get these two and then we'll go on over and work, work through our example um, as well. So the ClinVar variation ID can be found at the ClinVar website and you can either put in the gene um, with um, the amino acid and codon. Um, there are multiple ways to search. You could just put in the gene and click through a couple of variants um, and you'll come to the variant page then. This is the variant, variant view page and the variation ID is here and it's this number. So just below that on, on the website, there will also be the allele ID for ClenVar. And you want to make sure you don't get that ID. It's this ID right here, the ClenVar variation ID. It'll be kind of near the top of the um, ClenVar variant page. If it's not in ClenVar, if your variant does not have a variation ID, no, no variant page within ClenVar, you can still register that variant. And I won't go through all of this because we have several um, online videos and training for it as well, but you can use the ClinGen allele registry to be able to search for this gene within the allele registry. And this is a website that has pulled together billions of variants across multiple transcripts and multiple genomes and provides one stable ID across all of those. So um, there's a lot of um, online material that we have about using the allele registry in order to find um, an ID, but you'll need to have either the ClinVar ID or the allele registry ID to be able to proceed with curation in the ClinGen uh, VCI. So in this case here, this is just an example variant. This isn't the one that we would be doing for today, but this shows how to um, obtain a uh, allele registry ID and then this CA uh, number will be the number that's used if you if your variant is not within uh, ClinVar. So right then from there you go through and in this case we would add the ClinVar ID there. So why don't we go on over to the uh, VCI and work through our example for today. So here we are in the ClinGen VCI and um, you can click on login on the right hand side. And if you don't have an account, then you can create an account here. And then all of the um, information you need to add in here and create account. And you should be able to use that account automatically. Um, and in this case, I have an account, so I am going to sign in. That was the correct name and password. Wonderful. All right, so here I am in the no affiliation. And again, um, over here, it's now um, change affiliation here. You can click on, uh, and if you do have other affiliations, you need to make sure that you're working within the correct one. So I will be working within no affiliation. And so our variant for today is ACVR, um, L1, and it's the condition associated with this is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, and so HHT. And in this case, like we said, it is a pathogenic variant. And um, here is uh, we're provided as well with this ClinVar variation ID. So usually my process will be to look up this variant within ClinVar to look for any other references associated with the variant, and then um, to pull up a couple of other sites. So we can go through those sites um, that, I, that I also use in this process. So here's the variation ID, and I've pulled up the tabs already. But when we look here, then I put that variation ID into ClinVar, and um, this is a review status of one star. So um, ClinVar has a review um, a star system 
that labels variants based on the amount of information that's um, given to ClinVar by a submitter and the number of submitters that have submitted upon a uh, on a variant. So in this case, there's a single submitter, but they did provide the criteria that they used to interpret that variant. And so this gets a review st status of one star. Again, this shows this variant ID, which is here. And if you scroll down, you can see then what information was provided and what what the submitter was. So in this case, the submitter was Invite, which is a commercial laboratory in America. And they also provide quite often Invite provides very good comments um, along with um, this information. And many of the submitting laboratories do this. This is a very helpful section. So in this case, they list some PMIDs that um, where individuals have been identified with this condition. They also list some additional papers where multiple um, amino acids at this residue also disrupt ACVRL1. And then in the end here, they have classified this as pathogenic. So we'll go through and um, using similar criteria, walk through the VCI and see if we come to this same uh, pathogenic classification for this variant. So in this case, the variant does have um, a expert panel associated with it. I don't have that pulled up right here, but if we go to the um, if we go to the Clengen website, um, HHT is an expert panel. However, we don't have specifications yet for this. Um, let's see, here we are. Let's go down here, HHT. So they have not uh, published their specifications at this point. However, there is an expert panel for this condition. And it's another thing I always like to look at in curating whether or not there's an expert panel that has published um, specifications or whether or not there is one that's in progress. And then you just know who you could reach out to to ask further questions if needed or to make sure that you're um, paying attention when these guidelines or uh, specifications do come out for this particular gene of interest. So here we have then the um, variation ID, and we can take the variation ID, go into um, the Clengen VCI, and then do new variant curation. So when we do a new variant curation here, we can put this in, this is the ClinVar ID, and then click retrieve. And it will pull up a variant. There we are. Okay, it's taking a little more time than you wanted it to. So here is the variant. It's the same one that we will be curating, the same ClinVar ID. Always good to check. And then click View Evidence. And then here we are in the um, evidence view. And so in the evidence view, you can see multiple tabs are available. So there's the basic information tab, a population tab, variant type, experimental, case segregation, and gene centric. And in these views, there is no ability to enter the evidence codes. You just um, evaluate some evidence that's presented on these different pages. So here in the basic information, they have ClenVar um, information, primary transcript, um, some other evidence resources. In this case, sev uh, several of them aren't applicable to this gene, and so there is no information associated with it. It looks at nucleotide changes, on ensemble transcripts, and then the variance genomic context um, across multiple uh, genome builds. Right, so the next tab is the population tab, which um, includes the exact uh, scores, NOMAD database, page database, which draws variants from 
po um, diverse populations, thousand genomes and the ESP project. And then you have the ability to add in any PMIDs that are associated with population evidence. In this case, you can see that none of these resources contain this variant. So this variant is very rare and it's not seen on those resources. The next tab is the variant type tab. In this case, it is a missense variant. So this is the appropriate tab. This pulls together multiple in silico predictors. So the ClinGen predictor REVEL is located here. It also provides the scores for many of these in silico predictors, as well as the impact threshold that is published with these predictors and gives kind of a key here for the predictions. So for SIFT, D is D damaging um, for polyphen D is probably damaging and P is possibly damaging. So it gives a key to some of these um, uh, terms used here. I often use the test site just to get this table of predictors. I find it very easy to use. So I might just come onto the test site, put the ClinVar ID in, and then see what this ends up being across all of these predictors. There's also conservation analysis scores here and uh, links to splice site predictors to check uh, for splice site. Again, you can also add in PMIDs for functional evidence here and uh, PMIDs associated with variants in the same codon. And there are other variant types here where you can enter the associated information, such as loss of function, the silent and intronic, as well as in-frame indels. So in the experimental tab, then you can add associated information for hotspots or functional domains, as well as experimental studies. And then the case segregation tab is where you can enter any of the um, case data associated with this variant and as well the gene centric tab so the gene centric tab pulls up the exact constraint scores and some other information associated just with the gene and in this case you can see that we are working with a missense and the missense z score is 2.34 so higher um, missense Z scores are associated with intolerance to missense variants. I think the cutoff has been three for this. So this is under that cutoff. But again, it's just um, some guidance to use when considering whether or not this gene is constrained um, for missense mutations. So this is all just in the evidence view. And then here to do the interpretation, we'll click on the interpretation view. To do the, inter the interpretation, then you need to agree to this user agreement. And so this, uh, and for this, a user agrees that any data would be made publicly accessible, that unpublished patient specific data uh, will, will add uh, into the VCI, will only uh, enter, enter the minimum amount necessary, and then to avoid using any kind of protected health information, uh, in the VCI. So then you agree to these terms. And here it pulls up this variant. So you can see um, a different view here. So here you can add in the disease, which we'll do by getting the Mondo ID. And then across the top here, you can see the, all of these evidence codes that are part of the Richards et al. ACMG AMP variant interpretation guidelines. And so if you hover over each of these, it shows a small snippet of what the evidence code is. And then when you have um, chosen one of these evidence codes, it will color it in a darker color so that you can see which evidence codes you have um, viewed and have filled in. And, and we'll be doing that as we go through. As well, if you click on an evidence code, it will take you to the area to enter information. So in this case, if we wanted to enter information about population, it will take us here to the population code. 
So the first we'll do here is add the disease. And in the ClenGen VCI, we use the Mondo ontology set. So we will find the Mondo ID. So this is uh, one of the Mondo ontology lookup services that I use that contains the Mondo ontology. So then if you just type, um, type part of the disease name, it will do a look ahead. And here is the disease we are looking for uh, with the Mondo ID. So then you can just copy this Mondo ID and come back here and paste it in. So then it will retrieve your Mondo from there and you can save. So here it's saved this Mondo ID and we can proceed with adding our evidence codes. We can also add the inheritance. And so this is an autosomal dominant disorder. So we can click here. And if we needed to add any adjectives to that as well, we could do that. And we will just leave it here as autosomal dominant inheritance and save it. Right, now we can move through adding evidence in the evidence codes. So everyone has a different order in which they might prefer to move through these. I like to start with PM2, so the population databases and some of the more obvious um, ones. Now, when you click on one of these codes, it will take you to the area where you can fill in information about the code. And as well, once you have filled that in, the box will change color to this color here to alert you that there has been, uh, that this code has been modified and evidence has been added. So we can do this population uh, database PM2 code first. So we can see that there are no um, variants found in these databases. And the ClenGen SVI, the Sequence Variant Interpretation Working Group, has shown that PM2, which is a moderate weight, should be applied at a supporting weight for absence in a population database. So we will go ahead and put this as PM2 supporting. In addition, we have a standardized text to add um, to as, as an explanation. So I won't go through each of these, but I have prepped these in advance to add to our variant interpretation. In this case, we would say this variant is absent from NOMAD version two, and that would be our standardized text. So the version will typically be found here. In this case, I'm not sure why the version number is coming out like this, but it's usually V2.1, et cetera. So I put what I know is the current version of uh, Nomad currently, and then you can save. So you see then this is a filled in box here, uh, which alerts you that there's some data added in here. So another code that we will be using for this variant will be the PS4 code, which is uh, either the case control code or you can count cases. It can be a case counting code. So here I use the information that's in this um, variant from ClinVar. So we'll go here. This is our variant, the Pro433 serine. And there's a description here that contains some PMIDs and some evidence. So I pulled up these PMIDs and went through each of them to review the evidence inside. And I'm glad I did as um, one of the PMIDs referred here to a different variant, so different amino acid, um, but they did have our variant of interest in the text. So this paper was cited as well as an additional paper that has this variant in, in here from a proband. So we can count this one. There is also an additional uh, paper that was identified that has a family here. 
that also has HHT and um, also is showing segregation. So in this case, we can count one member of the family because for this code, you count unrelated individuals. So we can count one member from this family and we can count another proband here about which there was no other data in this paper. So we can have a count of two. So in this case, the HHT, there is a VSEP, a variant curation expert panel for HHT disease, but they have not produced specifications at this time. So they're still in process of producing those. So we know from other variant curation expert panels, for instance, here is the CDH1, they have often stratified the uh, numbers of case counts across different um, increases or decreases in the strength of this criteria. So here they have one family meets a supporting criteria, whereas two to three would be moderate, four to 15 is strong, and 16 and above is very strong. So in our case, we would have two individuals. So this would be two individuals here, and we could apply this PS4 at a moderate strength. So we can go here and find PS4, and this would be a moderate strength. And then we can put in our um, standardized text, which again, I prepped here. So this has been reported in and so we can also add our PMIDs here for this case evidence. So here we can select which type of curated evidence we want to add. You can add from a clinical lab, a clinic, a research lab, a database, or an other source. Here we'll do PMID and we'll add the evidence. So our evidence came from one of the families in the probands here. I'll add this example for this PMID um, that had a single proband. And then we've retrieved the correct article. In this paper, the proband was F86. So we try to use the label that is used within the paper. You can add phenotypic terms here with HPO terms. I won't go into those right now, but I will add some of the phenotypic information that was required. So in this paper, they had a, a criteria to diagnose with HHT, but they did not provide specific information about this sample. So we could put this um, criteria used for all of the patients within um, this paper as well. And then we can put that there was one proband um, and we can go ahead and save. And I'll make a note here that um, So now we have added this in, it relates to PS4, and we could add in the second paper as well for time. I won't do that right now, but we can add in multiple PMIDs that support our PS4 uh, criteria code. So next we can look at the uh, PP1 code, which is segregation data. So this family um, had segregation data in the second PMID that we were looking at. So it was this PMID here. And so we can count the segregation data. So we have one, two, three, four, and five segregations. And again, the specifications for this gene are not out, but we can use um, the PP1 codes from uh, other published groups as some guidance. So here was three to four informative meioses across one family, five to six across one family, or seven or more across two families. 
So here we have one family and we have five. So this achieves a moderate level of evidence. So we can go ahead and input that as moderate. And I'll pull up my cheat sheet here of the PMID and this evidence um, standardized language as well. So we can do that. That's our PMID and we can save. All right, next we can look at the in silico codes, so PP3. So let's take a look here. And in this case, we can see that the REVEL score is quite high compared to the cutoff and multiple others as well are showing damaging. So as we don't have the specifications, we can just focus on using REVEL to support this specification uh, or to support this evidence code. So I also have it in this cheat sheet here and the standardized text to add in. So we can say that this is met. and save. And once this evidence is added, you can see it is put into this summary table here with that lists the PMIDs, lists the curator enter, entering the PMIDs, and then the proband counts, or I have also added the segregation data into this as well. All right, so we have two more codes to go through before we can wrap up. So one is a code that we will not apply and following then a code that we will. So PM5 is a novel missense change at an amino acid residue with a different pathogenic missense change. In this case, um, for in ClinVar, you can see there is another uh, amino acid at this same codon. However, it is likely pathogenic. It's not classified as pathogenic. And then in our prior uh, papers, the PMIDs we have looked at, we've seen another amino acid at this same codon and as well another one here. So however, most groups do go on to specify that uh, the amino acid needs to be at least um, needs to have a difference, a larger difference on the Grantham score than the one that is classified as pathogenic. In this case, from arginine, leucine, and histidine, uh, serine is the lowest Grantham score amongst all of those. So arginine and proline is 103, leucine and proline is 98, and histidine and proline is 77. So here serine and proline has a score of 74. So in this case then we would not um, apply this score because serine is the least damaging in terms of the difference in the amino acids. So if we go back here, I have prepped some of the text for this as well. Um, just to make sure that it was, you know, I want to note that that I've seen this and looked at it, even if we are not um, ultimately going to apply that code. Okay, and then I'll put this here as not meant. Um, however, so any not met code then is grayed out, filled in with this gray color. However, this last code that we'll apply is a mutational hotspot or uh, functional domain. And given that there are multiple amino acids at this site, I think it we could specify it or it would be specified ultimately as a hotspot. Um, and again, the specifications are not out yet, but we can go ahead and add this here as met because of the multiple uh, amino acids that are seen at this site in affected individuals. So again, I have prepped this text here for this variant resides within a mutational hotspot. Mm, and we can further add which 
And we could also add additional PMIDs there to support that evidence. All right, so all of the codes that we have had that could apply, um, we did not identify any additional functional information or any de novo cases. So we've applied all of the codes here that, um, that could be applied currently. And just to note this reputable source code, PP5 is a code that um, we do not apply. So the ClinGen SVI has um, uh, specified not to apply this code. Um, so at this point then we are finished with our evidence codes and evaluations and we can move on to the summary. I do want to just note here that there is an audit trail so you can view every action that is uh, created within this interface. It will keep track of that and when you expand that it will show each of the actions taken. And so then we can go to view summary. So if you can see here, our classification is likely pathogenic. It did not come out as pathogenic as, it, as uh, we had seen with the ClinVar interpretation. So again, we have a standardized text for our summary, which I prepped some of here. It starts out by telling about the type of variant and then stepping through the evidence and then finally creating a summary. So we can paste this into here and clean it up just a bit. Then um, we can finalize this um, as well. So this, and then in summary, uh, we find it to be likely pathogenic and then you provide the evidence codes as well. So here we can save and then we can save this as a provisional interpretation and submit it as provisional and then we can as well see approval um, and if you have a different approvers within the vci you can add those so we will preview approval and submit approval. And at this point, we are, cannot do anything further. So we have our approved version, but we cannot um, submit it beyond that. So here in this table, we can see each of the codes that we have used for this evaluation and the explanation here. And then we can also see the criteria that we have not met here and as well criteria that was not evaluated uh, within this variant interpretation. So if we had the ability from here so um, to uh, submit this to ClinVar, we would then walk through the steps for submitting to ClinVar. So currently in the VCI, only approved expert panels are allowed to submit their variants to the evidence repository and then create a ClinVar submission. So we don't have that functionality in the test version, um, but it is available in the production version. So that is our walkthrough of curating a known variant in the ClinGen VCI. And you can see that we came out with a slightly different classification than we found in ClinVar. And we may, you know, additionally look for further evidence as well. Um, but I think that some of the nuances and differences such as dropping PM2 to PM2 supporting, so having the absence of Nomad um, be have a bit less strength in this evidence code um, may have made the difference in between the pathogenic interpretation in ClinVar and our likely pathogenic uh, um, interpretation here. All right, so if there are any questions we can review through any questions you might have and as well i'll also in this the slides that go with this we'll also put some links to further videos and education on using the clungeon vci and applying the acmg evidence codes all right uh, I think that was it. That's where the video ended. <laughs>
All right, thank you, Deb. We maybe have time for one quick clarifying question, if anyone has a quick question. I did put a lot into the chat as well, and I'm hoping that everyone was able to get the links um, in order to get on um, the Clungen BCI, the test version, and just click around. Yes, and Deb will be still on the chat throughout the next presentation. So if you have any questions you don't have time to get to now, but you want to chat to her um, while we're listening to the next presentation, that would be okay too, right, Deb? Yep, that'd be fine with me. All right, thank you. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Christine Preston, and she is a senior product manager with the Stanford ClinGen team, focusing on the development of the variant curation interface, or VCI, that you just heard about. So, Christine, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Erin. Um, so, I also pre-recorded a video, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and play that. And Christine, we're not hearing, we see it, we're not hearing any sound. Did it start yet? Oh no, really? Yep. Okay. If it's not working, I can give it a try. Just let me know. Um, I clicked the buttons, so. All right, why don't I try? If you're willing to try, that'd be great, thanks. Sure. All right, you stop sharing. Oh, yeah. All right, hopefully it will work on this end. Okay, hello. So many thanks for having me. My name is Christine Preston and I am part of the Stanford branch of the ClinGen team. So I think Deb did a really great job giving folks a feel for how the VCI works, what it looks like. I also know that there were a number of different resources and recordings that were added to the agenda. So for those folks looking to get a little more information on the classical single variant utility of the VCI, I think there's a lot of great resources there. So what I was hoping to do with the remainder of today's time is to walk you through a new feature that we've added to the VCI recently called Variant Prioritization, or VP. Uh, just to give you a feel for, for this new and exciting feature that we've added. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about kind of the overarching workflow of the VCI and the VP, which I think Deb, again, did a great job giving you a feel for. So um, as you saw, the VCI is, was really designed to support the FDA-recognized ClinGen variant curation process. Um, as Deb mentioned, that is based on the ACMG AMP guidelines. And I just want to highlight again that the interface is truly available to any interested variant curator. We have uh, affiliations. Obviously, we have the ClinGen Variant Curation Expert Panels, or VSEPs, are a big part of the folks using the interfaces, but anyone can sign up for the interfaces, um, and any group that's interested, regardless of whether or not they're ClinGen or not, um, in setting up an affiliation, and affiliation is where you curate, a group of people curate together as a team, all of that we support. So it, it is, it is an open source tool, and if you are interested, please sign up for it. So. The diagram shown here briefly describes the workflow supported by the VCI, a lot of this Deb went through. And in short, you start with selecting your variant. 
uh, using either a allele registry ID or a ClinVar variation ID. Then, as you saw, evidence of a number of different types is uh, a lot of it is brought in by the VCI itself. We also obviously support the addition of evidence by the curator. This is often in the form of um, PubMed IDs and, and literature, although we also support the addition of uh, lab and other data. So um, you bring in all this evidence, and then this leads to a classification selection of one of the five categories, benign, likely benign, uncertain significance, likely pathogenic or pathogenic. For ClinGen VSEPs, there's an expert review process, which is an important part of the um, um, process. And the final variant classification can be sent on from the VCI for approved ClinGen VSEPs. We send it on to um, an evident, that what we call the evidence repository or eRepo, which is a ClinGen tool. And also we support sending on for anyone um, their information to ClinVar and we're continuing to um, build that support and make it more integrated. But in any case, we had a paper recently describing the VCI published in Genome Medicine and again there are many um, resources that were linked in to the agenda that I think also provide additional information on the, on the VCI. So what's this variant prioritization feature that I've been talking about? So the VP is designed to support a pre-curation. This is filtering large sets of variants to identify high priority variants that then can go on to formal curation within the VCI. We also, I'll just mention, see this as a foundational piece for future bulk curation workflows within the VCI. And so this is the same picture I showed you just a few minutes ago um, of the workflow diagram that the VCI supports. It's what's in the center of the slide. So the VP is essentially conceptually upstream. It's an upstream workflow supporting pre-curation and it's summarized in this diagram shown here on the right side. So briefly, a curator will select a specific gene, HDNC gene symbols are what we use. They'll then filter on various different types of evidence that are within the VP, and I'll show you more about that in the live demo section. And this allows users to find specific variants of interest. They can refine the output and um, then can go on to fully curate that variant within the VCI. And there's um, a number of different types of evidence that are currently in the VP, as well as some ones that we want to add. But here's the current list. Uh, the VP contains variant identifiers, protein effects, and transcripts HGVS values. These are sourced from the allele registry. Canonical RefSeq transcript HGVSs and molecular consequences. These are sourced from Ensemble. The main transcripts, which are sourced from Maine, nomad population data, Revel pathogenicity predictor scores, which are sourced from myvariant.info, VCI interpretation statuses, which we get from the VCI, of course, and ClinVar interpretation data sourced from ClinVar. And in the far right column, you can see the intended update frequency for these various data sources. Um, we do have an emphasis made on keeping the data as fresh as possible. So now I'm going to do a brief live demo to give you a feel for what, what the VP actually is like. Okay, so I thought now we would do a live demo of the VP within the interface. So this is the dashboard of the VCI. And up here, uh, you can see there's this button variant prioritization and that's how you get to the VP. So let's go ahead and click on that. And this is the landing page. If you're part of an affiliation, if you're logged in as an affiliation, we enable searches to be saved and utilized. So that's what this use save searches up here. If uh, you're logged in as an individual, which I am right now, or if you're not part of an affiliation, then you won't have access to saving the searches. But in any case, how to use the VP is go ahead in here and you can see that right now the focus is gene-based. So the idea is you put in your gene of interest and you say, I would like to know 
all the variants you have and the associated information for this specific gene. And you can see down here, we have a list of the currently supported genes. We do intend to pretty dramatically expand this. So let's go ahead and choose one. So I'm gonna use run X1, which is a gene actually being curated by uh, ClinGen's myeloid malignancy sep. And um, the searching does take a little bit of time because all of this information is being collected so that the information can be as fresh as possible. So, but here we go. So this is now, um, the rest of the VP experience will largely be in this view. So this is the VP view. Um, I know you don't see anything immediately. So let's go over here because this is actually uh, a pretty important part of this. This shows basically your progress as um, the curator is, is doing the searches. And again, with the VP, the idea is you start with a lot of variants, you apply filter saying, I want to filter down the information that only applies, you know, um, to my specifications. And then you end up with a, a list of variants that meet those filters, those specifications. And so um, right here is an indication of all of the variants that were identified for this gene from the ClinGen allele registry. You can see it's almost 85,000 variants. That's a lot of variants. And once you click on that, then you'll see that this table down here, this kind of active table, um, will populate with a variety of different information. This table is highly customizable. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but this is kind of the um, default settings. So you can see there's the ClinVar um, canonical allele identifier from the allele registry. There's a standardized nomenclature, which is an HGVS terminology. Uh, there's ClinVar titles for those that are in ClinVar. There's molecular consequences using the main transcripts. And then, um, and, and you'll see you can customize this in, in a number of different ways. I'll show you that in a moment. So again, 85,000 variants is a lot. Um, we wanna filter this down based on some specifications. So I'm gonna scroll down and also just show you, um, this is one table you can customize how many, how long these tables are, but obviously this is just an enormous amount of data. So um, the myeloid malignancy group has put together criteria specifications for curating RUNX1 um, and they've published them. And so let's, let's use some of those um, specifications that they've put together to, to do some filtering. So I'm gonna add a filter. So this year, um, is the list of various filters. You can see we have a number of different types of ClinVar data in here. Um, we have molecular consequences. We have a large number of population data. This is Nomad V2.1.1 data. Um, and some number of different subpopulations. And we also have VCI interpretation status down here. So that's whether or not there is an active, or there is a record within the VCI for the variant. And then we also have this meta predictor, ClinGen meta predictor um, called Revel. So let's, let's add Revel. And so we've added that as a filter. And up here, you can see that we've already changed our numbers. So it's saying, okay, you started with 85,000. Um, there's a default setting for all of the filters. So we need to do more. We need to go into each of these filters and make sure that the settings are as we wish them to be, but there is a default setting. And so it'll automatically say, um, in this case, the default setting is, as you can see, that there's any Revel score. So not all variants will have a Revel score. Um, so over here, if you're seeing my cursor, you can see that that just doing that takes us from almost 85,000 variants to um, 3,300. But the myeloid malignancy VSAP has said for um, the criteria code PP3, they want a Revel score of um, greater than or equal to point, uh, 0.88, I believe. And um, Revel score is just to let you all know 
um, Deb showed this very briefly previously, go from zero to one with one being um, the highest predictive pathogenicity. So let's do greater than or equal to, you can see these filters, 0 0.88. So we will apply that. Okay, so you can see that now, again, these numbers are changing here. Um, and down here, they're also changing. And you can see, if you want, which ones have matched and which ones have not matched by clicking on these different tabs. But we're going to stick right now with the match. So you can see there's 621 variants that have a rebel score greater than 0.88. Okay, so we're going to close that filter. And then we're going to add one more filter. So this is going to be um, another specification I believe by the myeloid malignancy is that um, for run x1 is that to meet the PM2 criteria they say the variant needs to not be in population databases. Again we only have Nomad in here but it's a pretty substantial database. So let's go to population total. So this is all of the subpopulations. Let's open this up. So you can see again that there's a default. In this case, it's any total population. We will set our own, which is we want an allele count of, let's say less than or equal to zero, apply. And now you can see up here again, I hope you can see this, um, we're down to two variants. So let's close this filter up. Um, and so you can see there's these two variants and one of them over here, this bottom one, uh, the CA 1014559, you can see it, there is a VCI um, interpretation by an affiliation. My suspicion is that that is the myeloid malignancy VSEP, but you can see the other one up here does not have a VCI interpretation. And you can see over here of the population um, numbers for the total are shown as well. And um, so, you know, they might be interested in curating this or maybe not, um, but this is one of the reasons we built this tool is to allow groups to do these kind of quick filters, identify variants they might be interested in curating on. Um, and then we do have plans to um, enable the transfer of not only the variants to the VCI, but also some of the associated information going forward which could be a leverage for some bulk curation workflows in the, in the um, not immediate, but eventual future within the VCI. So we're very excited about all of those plans. And you may remember I said this table is very customizable. Let me show you how that works. So you go over to columns. So you can see there's these two tabs up here. First tab is filters. This other tab columns is how you control what is in this bottom table down here. I really hope I'm not getting anyone seasick with all of my cursor movement. Um, and so you can you can say I don't want standardized nomenclature. I don't want molecular consequences. I want front and center to see the Revel scores or I want to add a column and within these columns there's a long list of other um, things that could be added. So let's say we want to add, um, say we want to add the protein effects. Those could be added. Um, and some of these, I guess this is not one of them, some of these have additional information that can be modulated from within them. So for example, population, if you can see here, you can decide, I don't care about the frequency or I don't care about the homozygotes. Um, I don't want to see those in the table. I just want to see the total count um, and the little number. I'm going to turn this back on though. Okay, so that is a short demo. So hopefully this is giving you a sense for this new feature, the VP within the VCI. Uh, we have a large number of people to, who have contributed to this project. I'm very, very grateful to all of them for all the hard work and all of their thoughts and um, thankful to all of you for listening. And with that, I'm going to stop here and I guess we can answer questions. Thank you.